Welcome to today's webinar, Improving Your Nonprofit Impact Using Real Web3 Examples. Now, some of us may have some trouble imagining how we can actually apply these Web3 and decentralized technologies to solve wicked problems in our work. This technology, though, is more than just cryptocurrency wizards out there to make a buck. We're going to show you today how nonprofits and civil society organizations can use these new technologies in really practical, tangible ways. We, of course, are, are very grateful for the support of the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, who has been sponsoring us for this series. We've got Robert, aka Robbie, here with us today. I'm super excited to bring in this guest expert. Robert Greenfield is the CEO of Umoja Labs, and his blockchain experience goes way back to 2011, before I knew such a thing even existed. Um, prior to developing Moja Labs, Robert served as Consensus's head of social impact, and he co-founded the Blockchain for Social Impact Coalition, which is the world's first social impact block. He's also co-led some of the world's largest profile blockchain for social impact projects, including the first cryptocurrency-backed cash assistance program in Vanu. Um, and the first worker wellness pilot with the U.S. State Department. And I think, which is going to be really interesting, he also worked on the first fully transparent grant management solution with the World Wildlife Fund. He's got this huge wealth of experience, which means you're going to pepper with him with questions, try and trip him up, and let's like pull all the knowledge right out of that noggin. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up with those little reaction emojis to Robert Greenfield. Yeah, I very much appreciate it. And everyone really do appreciate your time. And, and just thank you for the opportunity to be with you all. And as he said, please actively ask questions, make comments, disagree, agree, whichever. I want to make this as much of a conversation as possible because as, and unfortunately, the world needs modernized methodologies to scale impacts more than ever. And so hopefully I can be a tool to uh, guide you toward whatever that may be for whichever impact your organization facilitates. Uh, as a, a quick introduction, Emoja Labs, we were founded in 2020 in the midst of the beginning of COVID, and we actually spun out of consensus. So prior, as Eli said, I was the head of social impact at Consensus and managed and developed all of the social sector and some public sector solutions that Consensus brought to market over a period of three to four years. And so Emoja Labs spun out, continued that work, and work, have historically worked with a lot of NGOs, and we've also extended into other product categories such as foreign exchange hedging in the context of um, SME uh, financing as well. Um, in the context of cash assistance programs in particular, which has been our namesake and usually is one of the first use cases that we're recognized for, we've deployed all over the world. And our focus generally has been, how can you leverage adaptable and emerging technologies such as blockchain and deploy them in not only emerging markets, but hard to reach regions with vulnerable communities. And so this means that you're going to have to deal with a great deal of or a lack of technical literacy, a lack of access to certain devices, and also a variety of local payment methods that are oftentimes not compatible with even international wires transfers. And so how do you take that technology and its transparency and its security and embed them in a way in which people can use them simply and reliably? And so today, I wanted to go over what blockchain for social impact is, touch on some real life use cases that I have been lucky to be a part of over the course of my career, and then also look into some impact opportunities as well, opportunities which amazing executives, leaders such as yourselves can it bring to the world that I think there's still pretty large gaps in and some of the obstacles as to why those gaps exist. And I put this in the context of Emoja Labs programming, but I think this is true more broadly, that there are a lot of different verticals of social impact as it pertains to blockchain technology. For us, it's typically financial inclusion, research and learning and humanitarian and development aid. So financial inclusion is really envelops every financially considerate programs, micro-saving, micro-loans, insurance, remittances, micro-work. Um, as many of you may know, um, but some of you may not, 
Um, blockchain technology lends itself very well to financial use cases, right? Um, and so it's typically one of the easiest use cases or use case categories to apply the technology to see if there's any real operational benefit. And of course, the second is research and learning. There are many ways in which the technology is hypothesized to work, but have not yet been put it to practice. And it's important to continually, one, theorize as to how it can be useful and find cost-effective ways to validate those hypotheses. But two, make sure that those proposals are in line with the existing methodologies that I know you all all hold near and dear to your heart, and which is also very important in my work as well. And of course, an offshoot of research and learning is policy development. As you all may have seen, particularly those who are in the United States, but also those London, those in Dubai, blockchain regulation is becoming a thing. How do you regulate the technology? How do you re regulate features of the technology such as cryptocurrency? And how do you not limit innovation to the point at which you are also limiting the potential impact for people, for example, to receive cash assistance in regions where it otherwise would be very difficult to deliver such assistance or other use cases as well. And so such research not only applies to use case deployment, but it can also apply to how your organization uh, or how your region looks at the technology from a public policy perspective. And then I, I have separated out humanitarian and development aid only because cash transfer programs and fundraising are the lifeblood of many not-for-profit organizations around the world. And it is a particularly pressing use case now. Obviously, we're all aware of conflict in the Middle East. We're aware of Sudanese refugee issues, aware of the situation in Haiti. There are a lot of, unfortunately, geopolitical conflicts that are blooming in parallel. And typically, the first response is the humanitarian aid. But oftentimes, those regions do not have the benefit of their beneficiaries having internet, smartphones, bank accounts, many of the things that maybe aid, say, in the Ukraine war situation may have an advantage of. And how do you get around those obstacles, but also leverage technology such as this? So we're going to get straight into it. I'll, I'll give you a premise uh, to each of these use cases. Please ask questions over time. And I'll try my best as we uh, yeah, go through this to pick up some of the questions that you might have. So awesome. let's actually start off with yeah. one really high level question that was yeah. coming in from Imani, which is just to say, is blockchain the same as Web3? Like, how do we parse yeah. these two different terms? That's, that, that is an excellent question. But there's a marketing side of that question. and There's also a technical side of that question. So the marketing side of that question is that, as you all may know, you can, before, all of the blockchain space really was referred to as crypto more generally. And that had been true for about half a decade after the introduction of Bitcoin in 2009. But unfortunately, cryptocurrency has a negative social connotation associated with it, right? You got the Silk Road, illicit markets on the dark web, obviously fraud cases such as what happened with FTX. And so as an industry, you have seen over the course of the last three or four years, the usage of Web3 as an enveloping term of the market rather than the usage of crypto or the usage of blockchain, the latter of which is a bit more technical. From a technical perspective, yes, Web3 envelops all technologies built on or associated with blockchain technology. It is indicative of uh, a more democratized internet and related services that Web2 traditionally has not offered. And in particular, uh, services that are more centralized versus being less centralized. A perfect example is obviously the case of finance, using code to facilitate certain transactions automatically rather than, say, a bank, which may have institutional solvency risks, many of which we saw earlier this year with a lot of mid-sized banks closing. And so that's the, the, the metaphorical and also technical kind of analysis on the term Web3. Awesome. That's super helpful. And to the rest, please keep adding those questions right into the chat. We'll either tackle them as we go or save some of the more gnarly ones for the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And gnarly questions are okay. Spicy, spicy questions are all right. I don't, I don't take anything to heart. I think we're all still figuring these things out together. So the, the first use case is Haas system. So 
some of you may be aware of, of who Hala Systems is. So Hala uh, develops effectively AI-based monitoring tools in and around Syria to ensure that certain attacks from typically from the Syrian government or its allies uh, are not perpetrated in areas in which they shouldn't, right? Mainly protecting civilian communities. And the way that they've historically done that is, is that they will have both some devices, so device-based monitors in different regions. Some will detect certain sounds, some will be video. It'll be a combination of technologies to get an understanding of the state of a particular area. And then they also use human observers and have an application for that. And effectively, what they try to do is to amalgamate the information from the devices and from the human observers to come to a conclusion as to whether a uh, war crime has been committed. Perfect example is, is that you may have a device uh, that is monitoring sound. It hears the sound of a jet in an area where there should be no jets. <laughs> and then you also see human observers see a bomb being dropped, right? Those two factors can be leveraged and presented as evidence in international criminal court and to prosecute governments or associated military groups of such war crimes. Now, traditionally, even with all that evidence, usually it's very hard to make that case. And because if I, as an observant citizen, trying to keep my community safe, accuse you of something and I present this evidence, the first thing that governments oftentimes do is say, oh, that's fake news, right? That's become a popularized argument <laughs> around the world. And the fact of the matter is because of where technology is, particularly AI, it's actually, it's a valid argument. You can now create images, videos, text, different aspects of evidence that is not real, that appears to be real. And so their question is, how do you prove uh, that their evidence that they collected at point A is real and relevant in point B when you're at International Criminal Court presenting that evidence. And so this was a very simple use case. It was just hashing, getting a fingerprint of that information, of that evidence collected at point A to prove that it has not been tampered with over time until it is presented in court. And you can do that very simply using blockchain technology, right? Transactions facilitated on a ledger, right? They have an immu immutability associated with them, meaning you can't go back and change them or it's very difficult to. Um, and in doing so on public networks such as Ethereum, right? You can take some information, hash it, which is typically a, a deterministic algorithm that gives a fingerprint or an ID associated with a particular set of information, put that into a transaction, and then reference that transaction at a much later date to show that information has not been tampered with. This could also be used in the context of police brutality. I've seen it applied in that context as well. And then another context, which we'll later cover. So this is you know, one example that we did a, a couple of years ago with Hall Systems, and they continue to engage with Web3 technologies as to how it can better their technology stack. The second is with the World Wildlife Fund. So a few years ago, Consensus and the World Wildlife Fund had two engagements. One was the Bait to Plate initiative, which was a uh, transparent supply chain use case. And another was a transparent grant management use case. This one speaks to the supply chain. As most of us don't know where most of the things that we consume, use, look at, come from. And increasingly, people are becoming a lot more health conscious as to not only are what are the downstream effects to those a, a part of that supply chain, but also how that affects themselves and their physiology. And in this use case, they actually could track all the way from Southeast Asia, I believe it was Fiji, the capture of fish and the delivery of said fish all the way to New York which people ate at a conference that Consensus had hosted. And of course, that level of visibility, understanding from bait to plate, where something has been, how it's been processed, who's touched it, at what time, we only have a loose understanding of how to replicate, right? And even some of the best systems like Amazon, for example, still struggles with origin source responsibilities, particularly when you have certain factories that serve many different customers upon thousands of product, products. It's difficult to understand, okay, are they using slave labor as a part of that production? And so this was a perfect use case that trial that you can 
provide such transparency. However, I will say that there's still much to be built off of, and though this was an earlier use case to show that international supply chains can embed within themselves a level of transparency where for every checkpoint across the supply chain, there is a transaction committed on chain to show that custody, you still need to embed that type of technology into your supply chain in the first place. And that can take time, right? Especially for very large supply chains. And it also is very dependent on the power balance between the retailer and the supplier, right? If you are a, a small percentage of the supplier's production, you don't have much leverage to tell them what to do. And actually, I had previously also worked at Amazon where I was on the social impact team where this was quite literally our responsibility. And in some cases, there were those asymmetric relationships. But again, another example. And if you Google bait to plate or bait to plate consensus, there's actually a video on this that you can look at on YouTube that visualizes the whole experience as well. The next is collaborative healthcare solutions. This very similar to the Hala Systems use case, but instead they were ensuring that sexual assault kits evidence was not tampered with. Unfortunately, in the United States, for those that aren't here, sexual assault as a crime is not one that has historically been managed very well domestically. There have been many cases, particularly in Detroit, but also in Oakland, and it's not just those two territories, there's other areas as well, in which law enforcement has been caught mismanaging sexual assault forensic kits or the kit of evidence of that individual's clothes, blood swabs, other artifacts that they collect once a sexual assault has occurred. And that has led to serial sexual assaulters continuing to perpetrate whichever crimes they are doing within the community, sometimes for decades. So it's a very serious problem. And in some cases, and again, I'm not saying that this is like a, a widespread issue, but it is an issue and it does continue. The underlying evidence for the sexual assault forensic kit can be tampered with if there are entities within an agency that prefer that evidence not to get out. That can be for political reasons. That can be for the reason that the perpetrator is a part of the law enforcement team itself. Many different reasons, but still it's rather unacceptable. And so you can leverage that same tamper-proof evidence mechanism in this use case as well. And I have a wholly different type of impact. And Collaborative Healthcare Solutions continues its work to, to this day. They also more broadly help a lot of law enforcement agencies iterate on their processes with regards to how such evidence is collected, because it's also a somewhat embarrassing is not the word, but I, I would say maybe even humiliating experience when you are recently assaulted and you have to go through this process of evidence collection right after, right? You haven't even been able to de deal with your trauma and so they're, they're, they're doing great work. And that was one of the things that we investigated with them. Project on Black Ice, this is probably one of the more quote unquote famous, and maybe I'm patting on my, my back too much, so certainly let me know if I am, use cases that we will review. Project Unbox Cash was, and let me be careful because they, <laughs> when any when anytime someone uses the word first, people start to get very yeah, aggressive. It was the first international humanitarian aid program that leveraged stable coins. Uh, and specifically it used DAI. So DAI had just recently come out. USDC did not yet exist. And um, it used it in uh, Vanuatu. Uh, so Vanuatu is a uh, Pacific uh, island nation. It is the most disaster prone nation on the planet. They have volcanoes. They obviously get earthquakes because of those vol volcanoes, but they also have cyclones as well. In which case, the vast majority of individuals do not have birth certificates. Um, many do not have phones. And the only way really to safe keep your money is to, to quite literally bury it. In fact, a few years ago, around that same time, the central bank had introduced a plastic variant of their money to make doing so easier. Um, so that is the context. And also, as many of you may know, cash transfer programs do not have the best record with regards to monitoring transparency. And that's oftentimes because either it's facilitated in actual cash, it can be facilitated with paper vouchers, which are better, but it's hard to reconcile. And of course, it's not easy to keep track of. 
And even the usage of mobile money via tools like M-Pesa and the, still have limited transparency issues, right? When you use M-Pesa, you cannot determine the exact item that someone got. You can determine maybe sometimes the merchant that person transacted with if there is a good relationship with that mobile money vendor after specific contracts have been set up between the NGO and the mobile money vendor, right? And so this was one of the first ever use cases that show that you can leverage blockchain technology, that same transparency element that we continue to hit on, you can leverage that in a way that one, allows people with lower technical illiteracy and access to resources to use it without having to understand what blockchain is. In this case, it was NFC cards. So every beneficiary received an NFC card. That's just a plastic card for those who are not familiar with the term uh, NFC is near field communication. So it, 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 technology very similar to Bluetooth in a way as a rough comparison. So it, it receives and can signals from different devices. And, and then there was also a mass payout dashboard. And so effectively the flow was is that you would register beneficiaries as you typically would. Uh, you could do that via COBOL toolbox. You could do that via Excel. Did not need internet to do that. You would get the bare minimum information from those individuals. They don't need to have phones, name, their, their sex, wh whether they're representative of a family or not, and based off of the needs analysis that you facilitated in that particular area. And then after you registered those individuals, they would be handed these cards and effectively a, uh, a stable coin balance or a digital dollar balance was sent using blockchain technology to their cards, right? So they didn't need to do anything for that to occur. Um, the NGO, NGO knew, and in, the, in this case it was Oxfam, knew exactly how much money has disburse, been dispersed to whom. Um, and everyone had a PIN code, so it would make it harder for someone to steal someone else's card. And more importantly, the money on that card cannot be used for anything but the participating merchants within that program. So this was a conditional program. And so you had a full control of funds. But even more, you could determine the spending patterns over time to better prepare for future disasters. So now, instead of settling transactions net 30, you're settling transactions instantaneously in real time. Instead of providing impact reporting on a quarterly basis, you can have donors look at the analytics dashboard in real time and see how their capital is being used. So you had 100% monitoring transparency. And then of course, those merchants who typically have access to more resources they would then off-ramp to, to the local currency, which is the Vatu in this particular case. This program started with, I believe it was around 300 people at scale to over 40,000, dispersed, I believe, in aggregate about $3 million in and of itself, and also led to the development of Moja Labs and the facilitation of our work in other areas like Colombia, Venezuela, Kenya, and, the, and even Haiti. And, and and what it has proven is that there is a way in war-torn or disaster-prone areas to facilitate digital cash transfers with 100% monitoring transparency as to how that capital is used, both in conditional and in unconditional scenarios. And you do not need to be interconnected with the payment systems of those regions necessarily to enable them to work. And there's a huge documentary that we created with Project Unblock Cash. The partner in this case was a company called Simpo, who Consensus, and as I was at Consensus at the time, worked with very closely. And yeah, it was, it was just an overall great experience. And we have case studies for some of the other deployments that we've done as Emoja Labs as well. So bounties for ocean conservation. So an interesting one, and it is different in that it is not just sending money somewhere or getting something right? Proving something that hasn't been tampered with. This introduces the theme of game theory that is very relevant to Web3 technology. And what I mean by that is, is that in, in Web2 technologies, whether it's traditional banking or the internet or the normal applications that we use, though they do certainly use psychological game theory to inhibit certain actions or to incentivize them, Oftentimes, they're not very creative at doing so, nor are they generally directed at generating impact. And so the context of this particular project was how can you get individuals 
to become incentivized to clean their own communities and earn an income in doing so. And the two partners in this were Consensus Social Impacts of Mojo Labs Now and the Bounties Network. Uh, unfortunately, the Bounties Network is no longer active, but effectively, it, it is what it sounds like. It is a network of community-developed bounties that anyone can participate in and earn an income in fulfilling those bounties. And those bounties can be everything from write me an article to clean up trash in Atlanta and prove that you did by taking a picture or something like that, right? And so this was facilitated in the Philippines. If any of you are familiar, there are certain areas within the Philippines that are quite literally made of trash. They're villages that are set within landfills. And obviously, it's not a healthy place to live and a great place to incentivize people who otherwise might not have other work opportunities to help clean and earn an income from. And so it, it was very interesting. It was a different use case, and it was something that I think I would like to see more of because these creative approaches of aligning both environmental impact with economic impact at the same time are few and far between. And, and I believe there's also a documentary on this as well. Yes. So if you want to look up Bounty Network, Consensus, Philippines, a general Google search, I don't quite remember the, the name of the documentary, but it is on YouTube and also a great watch if you are interested. So Luxarity, this is getting more into a social sector, commercially philanthropic use case. Luxarity is the social arm of Lane Crawford Joyce. Lane Crawford Joyce is one of the largest retail clothing goods companies in the world, based in Asia. And what Luxarity does is every year, and I believe they still do this to this day, they do this in Hong Kong around this time of year, November, December, they get donors to donate luxury goods, secondhand luxury goods, Louis Vuitton bags, Gucci belts, all that good stuff. And they resell them and they use the capital from those resales to provide community grants, whether it's community grants in fashion for those who otherwise wouldn't afford the ability to learn more about it or to local schools, et cetera. And the issue, the problem that they wanted to solve was is how, if, if I give a Louis Vuitton bag as a donor, how do I know what my end impact is, right, um, when the grants are provided? How much of that grant did I contribute? Uh, how much of the scholarship or how many people did I affect? And so in the same way that we've seen blockchain technology is extremely useful for hyper transparency and traceability, you can do so in, in this context as well. You can take a good, you can record when it's been donated and by whom, you can record when that exact same item is sold and how much money it's generated. And now you can proportionally report back what the economic impact to the donor was. And I believe we had done over, I think it was around $50,000 in sales within a two-day span. All of it was facilitated directly on chain. This was actually on the Ethereum network. I was actually one of the developers of this project. And yeah, it was very interesting. And, and again, you could show that impact in real time. And so just another example of how it can be helpful. So any of you who have models that are similar to this, certainly a page to, to tear some notes from. Uh, so more broadly, impact opportunities. As you've seen a lot, there, there have been a lot of startups that attend to one or if not multiple of the problems that we've gone over. But there are still many gaps in what both the social sector, the public sector, but the world need more generally. Carbon credit markets is definitely one of them. For those who are unfamiliar with carbon credit markets, the only note that I can leave you with is that they are completely messed up. <laughs> they are not, they, from an infrastructure perspective, from a bureaucracy perspective, they are completely misaligned with the intended environmental impact domestically in the United States, but also internationally. And so if you do want such markets to thrive, become more liquid, and I think even become more verifiable and more reliable, this is an obvious use case for the technology because it has some financial aspects to it, but also has some transparency aspects to it as well. And there are some startups that create such markets. Flow Carbon is one of them. 
And there, there are a few others, but if you type in carbon credit market blockchain, you'll see several types of these markets. And so it is starting, but I think the one issue that a lot of these companies have is the economic viability, right? Because it needs to be a sustainable business model to continue that project as well as provide such markets. Evolution of microfinance. Outside of just sending money, getting money, understanding when it got there, you can now start to, to tokenize or to create a digital representation a value that was previously very difficult to make fungible, to make transferable. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example in the context of microfinancing. When you look at the agro value chains, the agricultural value chain for rice in Tanzania, oftentimes you'll have a farmer, uh, they need to get some financing, usually it's from friends, family, to afford water costs, to afford fertilizer, to afford seeds. And they will do the math, grow the crop, and then they will pay back those proceeds to those individuals and ideally keep half of that as a profit to sustain their income. And within that chain, there is warehousing of their rice. They have the rice, put it in the bag. They want to warehouse it. Some people do it purposely to wait to a certain part in the season where prices are the highest, right? And... In exchange for taking that rice, that bag of rice, to the warehouse, they get a receipt. And that receipt says, you have four bags of rice here, right? You can come back and uh, you can get those four bags. This is something that could, if digitized, be used to access more financing for that next season, right? You could have a farmer leverage a tokenized receipt of rice being warehoused to as collateral for a loan, right? And this is something that happens regularly. It happens every season. And it does happen across many different agricultural value chains in different ways. And so when I talk about the evolution of microfinance, it's not just about digitizing it. I think in many ways, it's already been digitized at scale in many different regions. It's talking about how can you find and create different credit models or collateral models that already occur in the informal credit market that can put less cost or economic strain on the borrower, right? That's where the magic is. And investigating and investing in those type of models is going to be a lot more helpful. And interestingly enough, a lot of these communities within their informal credit sectors already have these models, right? For example, saving groups, that's a model. It's not a model that you oftentimes see in the West, but it is extremely capital efficient and makes perfect sense. And that is why you've seen many startups starting to digitize saving groups. And there's a lot of variations and build off models that you can create to maintain default risk, but also increase credit accessibility as well. And we've done a bit of this in Morogoro, Tanzania, done short stints and microfinance programs over the, the previous year. Obviously, tokenization of emerging market fiat currencies. So this is a big one. For any of you who, especially if you are doing any financial related programming, the digitization of currencies is inevitable. It is inevitable. It is a fact. It will occur. It is already occurring. You must leave this workshop with that knowledge. And over the next decade, likely, you will see many central bank digital currencies produce you will see many private digital currencies of different regions produce, one of which in the United States is USDC. But I've been in a recent conversation with the United Arab Emirates or individuals from that region, and they're going to be introducing a digital Durham as well. And so it is very important that you adapt your methodologies. You don't need to change the way that you engage with communities, but you do need to adapt the ways that money is monitored and transferred to this new reality because it is going to happen. And another important thing to, to realize is that with the increased digitization of national currencies, uh, the biggest export of a lot of these country becomes their own monetary policy. So what does that mean? So for a very long time, one of the biggest exports of the United States has been the U.S. dollar, right? And because it, it, it's a good store of value, right? 
one of the world's largest economies. And so the feature that everyone appreciated was is that if I put my money into this asset, it will not depreciate, or at least it won't depreciate at the speed of my own currency. And thus you see global trade, particularly in emerging markets, global debt investment, usually denominated in USD. Over time, this is obviously changing because the USD is uh, going through a great deal of inflation, right? That is also inflating the local currencies. And you also have international partnerships like BRICS forming and taking on many members to de-dollarize their economy so that they have more monetary control over their policies, which I think is a smart thing for those countries to do. But when you digitize these different currencies, what happens is that now someone is not necessarily only judging that currency by it being a good store of value, right? You could have a country say, hey, if you just hold our currency, we'll offer you a savings rate of 12%. And many of us know in Eastern African countries, the average sovereign bond gives you about 12%, right? Now, these type of rates are typically offered or even accessible to individuals now because you would have to open up an account to be able to access that sovereign bond and do a whole bunch of things. And thus, it's not very fungible. But increasingly, it will become fungible. And now you're not only looking at, is the money that I have a good store of value? Does the money that I have create a good yield for myself? Does the money that I have in transactions provide me a discount? Or does me hoarding a certain amount of capital allow me other potential secondary benefits like being able to get a visa sooner? So money, the value of money will start to become featured as it becomes more digital. And so outside of the transparency and security and the modernization aspects of cash transfer programs and microfinance programs as it relates to money, these other considerations are things that your organizations should certainly think about. Because although they might not necessarily be as pertinent now, they are a financial inevitability. It may take a decade or so, but it will happen. And this is why I put this in here more, more generally. Obstacles. So to finish off, regulatory ambiguity, right? Particularly around digital currency. This is not me. <laughs> That's not that, that every cryptocurrency is related to crime. I don't want to give you that, that, that feeling. That you do need to have, you do need to do your own due diligence. You do need to have a compliance regime as to how risky you assess certain cryptocurrencies to be. You do need to limit how many cryptocurrencies you're exposed to in the context because a lot of the regulation is around cryptocurrency and not necessarily the underlying technology of blockchain. Uh, and, and to be optimistically cautious based off of the model and methodology of your particular organization, but do not be too cautious as to not take action or as to think that you can continue pushing back all of these considerations with regards to taking in donations, with regards to facilitating digital cash transfer programs in perpetuity, because that's just negating your responsibility for what's, what is real, what is happening. And so it, it does need to be an active approach, though it doesn't necessarily need to be a reckless one. The second is user experience and design of applications. This is one of the reasons why, you know, when Emoja first started, we only focused on non-smartphone devices, feature phones, NFC cards, right? WhatsApp, right? On old Android phones. We didn't focus on iOS or iPhones, right? It doesn't make any sense because none of the individuals that you're serving are likely to have an iPhone or a new Android. And so a lot of the interfaces of these applications that hope to do good don't understand the reality of the device accessibility and the technical literacy constraints within the regions they help to impact. And that's generally because a lot of the creators and, and much like myself are from the West and they are not embedded within these communities to understand those realities. And so we need to do a better job at enabling entrepreneurs from those communities to solve those problems by investing in them. Third, disconnection between NGOs and technology companies. I have, and this is why I love TechSoup, right? have social and private sector relationships, not just in the context of donations. I know as a fact that overhead is always something that we always worry about within the social sector, but we never really talk about how we can minimize overhead where it is reasonable. I think that part of the overhead conversation is ridiculous is people do need to live in order to create the impact that we, we make. 
But I do think that a percentage of that overhead can be greatly reduced if methodologies are modernized in a responsible way. And I have not seen that done enough from multinational NGO to regional NGO. And as you all know, the rate of global need, particularly for humanitarian aid, far outpaces our ability to attend to it. And we can start to catch up if we create these private and social sector collaborations. And again, in the context of scale, not in the context of fundraising for a particular project, in the context, that is the way that you will do things from now on once you find a way to do it that you and those communities you serve are comfortable with. And that's a process, right? It starts with a small pilot of trusted individuals that you have close relationships with of that vulnerable community. And then it gradually scales to, to acceptance. It's not something that you should force on anyone, but it is something that it will help reduce your costs. A perfect example in the cash assistance program, the Project on Black Cash, that's delivered a 92% more effectively than the previous methodologies that they were using, which was mobile money and cash value. And, and generally from what we've seen, it's always been about above 80% increased efficiency. That significantly lowers overhead and allows you to deploy programs in seconds rather than in months when you've already reached out to certain beneficiaries that you know are going to be double, three-time participants because of particularly disaster relief needs. The last is a lack of willingness to sandbox solutions. I think that some NGOs that are large enough can't afford to sandbox solutions. Others, but they might not have the capital resources to do that. I think this is more broadly a public sector responsibility. If you do have relationships with the local central bank or representatives, just making sure that they're aware that, again, especially on the financial use case side, one of the, one of the benefits of the blockchain technology more broadly is enabling people to have financial services across a broad spectrum that otherwise do not do so. And it does it better than any other digital solution because of the security and the transparency. And, but in order for those solutions to become viable, particularly for vulnerable communities, you, you, you need to have a sandbox in which you can facilitate them amidst the regulatory ambiguity of those regions, right? Because the uh, United States is rather on the negative side when it comes to regulatory landscape, but there are other areas that are more positive, like that of the United Arab Emirates, or that of London, but then there are other areas that have no consideration as to how to use these technologies at all. And thus, rightfully, your organization may be trepidatious in uh, employing those tools. And so that's pretty much it. Apologies, I didn't look at the questions, but we love questions. We can get into a discussion. Awesome. We've got six minutes, so let's fly through these. Let's start off with a good leading question. Robbie, say my organization wanted to create a digital mass payment solution purpose built for vulnerable communities. Yes. Who should I talk to? How would I make that thing real? Yeah, talk to, talk to us. <laughs> we already have one. Uh, we've deployed it with Oxfam, World Vision, CARE, deployed it across six countries, over $3 million disbursed today, tens of thousands of people served, and we primarily focus on individuals who do not have access to smartphones and have very low technical literacy. So it is extremely adaptable. We would love to work with you. Awesome. So I've got a pair of questions here from Paul and Imani talking a little bit about verification. Um, so Paul asks, what controls are put in place to prevent the creation of fake individuals? Because while the blockchain may give us verification, it doesn't necessarily verify a human necessarily. Yes, absolutely. We have historically required the NGOs that we work with in the past to facilitate in-person KYC. And the reason why it's in-person KYC, because as we know, many of these individuals don't have identification documents, right? And so there has to be a country staff responsibility to ensure that people that are participating in a program are adequately registered and appropriately dispersed toward. Of course, What's very interesting is even in the case of, say, you have a fraudster amidst the beneficiaries, they're not able to leverage that capital in a way in which they can easily commit the fraud itself. And what I mean by that is, is that in an unconditional program, the worst that they can do is transact that money with an approved merchant and then maybe offsell that thing that they got because they can't use the money for anything else. Um, in an unconditional program, they can withdraw from a merchant 
but you can see you can see patterns actively as to how people are using the money and you're also can in control as to the disbursements that go to those individuals so their ability to siphon funds from a cash program would be severely limited and if you did see any coordination with say a staff member because that's really the only way that can really happen is you have to coordinate with the staff member to facilitate such fraud it would become immediately you would see it you would see it immediately and you can pause while it's you can delist participants and then of course fortify your methodologies to avoid that but uh, to your point there is no fraud proof technology out there as long as humans stay creative <laughs> fair enough so it's more a process not a thing we can just turn on turn off yes absolutely cool here's a question coming from team csr box who's curious about how costly is it to de deploy these kinds of Web3 technologies you've been talking about today in a developing country like India? What are those current avenues? Is the best way to talk to an Mojo.money? What's, what's the way people would begin this work? I, I would say in the context, if you had a specific program in mind, uh, I would say that you would want a private sector partner focused on that particular use case, yes. Otherwise, it is quite expensive to build these solutions from scratch, and it takes many different iterations. Now, I will say it's a lot less expensive now than it was before. When we got started, there weren't all these multi-billion dollar companies with APIs and all these easy ways to create things. You really did have to create things from scratch. Now, that's not necessarily the case. But unless, one, obviously you have the resources to develop to, to invest in developers and those developers would need to ideally be on your team, right? The, the issue of using contractors to develop internal solutions is that you become perpetually reliant on those contractors. And in times of bad, when there are bugs, that just increases your overhead. And that's why I usually say, if you are not a technology driven NGO, which I know some of you may be, and you're not familiar with that product development process, it is better to find a, a, a private sector partner that can implement that for you. And I think the last thing we've got is an interesting potential use case that Imani has been sharing in the chat. Do you want to come, Imani, do you want to come on camera on mic? Yes. Hi, Robbie. You are just really amazing and I have been waiting all my life to hear this presentation. I actually partnered with an international organization that helps people in poverty-stricken areas like Vietnam, South Africa, learn how to use technology and leverage that technology to solve problems in their own community. And I was in a webinar where they were talking about the problem that the Gullah Island people have, and I'll just read this to you. The partition sales are the cause of dispossession crisis, According to the Heirs Property Retention Coalition, property developers entice faraway relatives who may never have visited their family's land to sell their share for a fraction of its market value. Once they buy a share, these developers can then sell all of the land at auction for a large profit. And we need to be able to have people verify their ancestral claim to that land and have it be held in check so that these developers have to go through an oversight yeah. and other people that have shares in that land, they have to know that this person is trying to sell off yeah. part of the inheritance because it affects the value of everybody that's there. Would that be an act application that Umoja Labs can help? So there are, it, it wouldn't be not necessarily on the land title verification, but there are companies that focus on that exact use case. I can refer a few to Eli to share with everyone, but if you wanted to do some investigation yourself, like land title and, and tokenization would be the prompt, but there are. And I know that there are a few that are deployed in different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and some in Southeast Asia as well. I know that more broadly, the problem that they've had with regards to adoption has been getting those communities, which to your point, a lot of communities, there, there are no titles. There's just an ancestral heritage and, and everybody knows from that community who owns what, right? 
um, the go to market to capture those individuals and leverage digital tools and in, 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 in capturing those kind of ancestral land titles uh, has been hard for some of those platforms to really break into. But I think to your point, someone like yourself who's very well connected within those communities or organizations that affect those communities is a lot easier. So I think that the best partner, and this is a perfect example to the private social sector partnerships, the best partner for that type of company is going to be someone like you because you enable them to be trusted by the community and everyone to work in tangent with one another. But private tech companies going into smaller regions where you, you, it's more village than city, obviously the trust hasn't been built, especially with something as sensitive as land ownership, which is to your point, the, at the crux of, of wealth for that particular community. Thank you so much, Robbie. And I will be contacting you uh, to make a connection with this international community. They're going to be so excited to find out uh, about the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for the work you do. No, I, I appreciate the work you do and I, I appreciate your kind uh, comments. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robbie. I'm really delighted to have you come here today and share your expertise.